Well, Morse felt that everything he accomplished, and he accomplished a lot, boomeranged on him. It all came back uh, with some bad result. Uh, he, he could never uh, have some kind of success without it being followed by some failure, some disaster. Well, very briefly, I mean, Morse's family thought that he was fickle, that he moved around from one thing to another. And in fact, he accomplished a lot of things and moved into a lot of places. He was an important painter. He was an important inventor. He was an important politician. And he was a pioneer photographer. He painted portraits to support himself and to support his family, but he hated doing that. I mean, it was considered sort of the lowest branch of painting. What he wanted to do were these large historical canvases like uh, Raphael's The School of Athens, you know, that shows uh, Socrates and Plato and, uh, and everybody else. Uh, and he, he tried uh, to do that, to get away from traveling around itinerant, uh, as an itinerant portrait painter. Finley Breeze Moores. Uh, the Finley came from his mother's family, uh, his grandfather. His mother's father was the president of Princeton. He's best known for, of course, the, let's call it the American Electromagnetic Telegraph. Uh, I, I'm, I, I'm being that precise because there were other telegraphs uh, around that uh, were invented independently of Morse, uh, others that didn't work by electromagnetism, others that weren't American. But the telegraph that we know, the telegraph that became the Western Union telegraph, sort of the world standard, that was really Morse's invention. He, um, he taught at NY, New York University. Uh, he was um, hired as the first professor of fine arts uh, in the country. And he had a studio in the uh, New York University building where he taught painting. Uh, it happened, though, that in the same studio, he was always putting to, also putting together his first telegraph. And he had wires stretched around the room and his frames and, uh, and so on. He began doing photography uh, at New York University, and he put up a photography studio on top of the building and was taking portraits of uh, uh, prominent New Yorkers. He had a lot going on at the same time. He was a politician all of his life. I mean, Morse was a profound cultural nationalist. I mean, he had a, a very strong sense of identif identification with the revolutionary generation. I mean, his, his great heroes were Washington and uh, Lafayette and, uh, you know, the, those people of uh, the late 18th century in America. Um, and he, um, throughout his life, I mean, he ran twice for mayor of New York. He ran once for uh, his district, uh, congressional district in Poughkeepsie, New York, and people wanted him to run for president, but he declined. Uh, he always lost badly, uh, not, all, not, not necessarily because of his politics, but Morse, despite his you know, great sophistication in um, invention and painting and everything else, in many ways a very naive person, and certainly very naive when it came to hardball politics. And, for instance, in one New York mayoralty race, uh, I think the Whigs, some Whigs published a notice in the newspaper signed by him, by Moore, saying that he had withdrawn from the race. And this was the, the day before the election. So he ended up with about 50 votes, I think, at a, and uh, James Fenimore Cooper said, who was a friend of his, said, well, he would have won the election if he had had another 15,000 votes. He had no kind of sense of how to deal, I think, on this level with you know, sort of tough, practical people. Well, I write biography, and I you know, look as I look back over things, I've been trying to do a kind of national portrait gallery of people who I think of as representative figures in American culture. I have a, a minister, Cotton Mather, whom I wrote a biography of. I have a poet, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, who I wrote a biography of. I have an entertainer, Harry Houdini, who I wrote a biography of. And now I'm trying to do a, an inventor here as a different sort of figure. The, uh, there was also the fact that there hadn't been a biography of Morse for about 60 years. Uh, that was a, another attraction. And also I was very attracted to the huge amount of information that existed about Morse. I mean, here in Washington, I mean, the National the uh, Smithsonian Institution and the Library of Congress has thousands and thousands of letters. The Museum of American History here has the fabulous Western Union collection on telegraph on the telegraph. Uh, I like to work with a lot of material, you know, um, and I don't like to work where material is scarce. So that, that was another big attraction. I live in New York City. Mostly I've taught at New York University. I taught um, American literature and some American history. My interest has always been, though, in American culture. Uh, that depends. I mean, I, I wrote a book on the American Revolution 
uh, went 35 years or so ago, which was also very biographical. I mean, it was it's called A Cultural History of the American Revolution, and it followed the careers of painters like Benjamin West and John Singleton Copley and poets like Philip Freneau and um, uh, actors and dancers and musicians during the Revolution, see what they were doing. Uh, my sort of the thesis of it was that during the Revolutionary period, there came into existence for the first time a, a really a sort of American artistic culture. And I, I, in sort of illustrating that, I follow the careers of painters and dancers and so on. So it's very biographical. So I, I feel I've always been writing biography in my whole professional life. Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's not so easy, I guess, to get a model. I mean, you're there, you look at yourself in the mirror and uh, sketch yourself. Um, I don't. I don't know another. I don't know another explanation. Maybe there is one. He was born in Charlestown, Massachusetts. Um, his father was the minister of the First Congregational Church in Charlestown, one of the oldest churches, congregational churches in America. Uh, Morse has a, a long background in New England Calvinist Protestantism. His father was Jedediah Morse and was very well known. Um, we we don't know his name so well, and I don't know that we. Uh, no, Sammy Lefty Moore is uh, his name so well either now. But his father was, uh, he's referred to as the father of American geography. In addition to preaching at the church and being one of the leading ministers in America, he produced the first American geographies. And it was said that every American house had three books. They had a Webster spelling book, they had a Bible, they had a Webster spelling book, and they had one of Jedediah Morse's geographies. Well, his mother, uh, as I mentioned, was the daughter of um, the president of Princeton University. She was a very sharp-witted, very tart uh, woman. I mean, very, very smart. And uh, uh, she, she didn't. She said what she thought, uh, including about her son Samuel. No, I think after he wanted really to be Morse. I mean, his father was very well known. His father had dined with George Washington. His, his father knew everybody in the country. His father had a large reputation. And he, I, I think Samuel always wanted to have that sort of reputation for himself and to be Morse. He, for him to be the Morse. It was a sort of nickname, you know, like Buster or something, I guess, the uh, child, childhood nickname. Although people close to him, uh, remember his first wife, I think, still called him Finley. He went to uh, Yale. Well, first he had gone to Phillips Academy. Uh, as a young, as a boy, and then went to Yale as his father had gone, and his father, Jedediah, was a Yale trustee. So all mm. the boys went to Yale. He had two brothers, too. Yes, that's a portrait of Lucretia. Uh, he was, in his itineracy, he was traveling around from town to town, setting up as a itinerant portrait painter and uh, advertising, you know, come and I'll do a portrait of you. And he met her, it was in New Hampshire, uh, as he was painting on one of his portrait tours. He had two brothers. Uh, it had been a very large family. It was always astonishing to me. I think they lost something like nine children. I think the, uh, he had had nine other brothers and sisters all died. Uh, a, a huge role. Sidney uh, was a very respected newspaper editor in 19th century America. I mean, he was the publisher and editor of the best known, I suppose, religious journal in the country, the New York Observer. I mean, it had a very big subscription. It was very prosperous. Uh, Sidney was able to buy a newspaper office building on Nassau Street, I think it was, in New York. Uh, and for a while, Richard, brother Richard, also worked with the, the New York Observer. Although Richard, rather like Samuel, seems to have been afflicted with uh, the family gremlins. I mean, he was a very depressed guy, He, Richard, uh, always wandering around and searching for some kind of relief from his heavy-heartedness and un generally unable to settle down. Uh, but uh, Morse kept in very close touch with his brothers for his, for his whole life. Uh, he had three children by his first marriage, and again, I think two died in infancy. Two others died in infancy. And then, I believe, as I recall, four, I think, by his second marriage. Well, it's a wonderful painting. I mean, it's, I just say, at the Corcoran Gallery. He worked on it. My recollection is that he worked on it for almost a year. I mean, this is the kind of painting Morse really wanted to do. He worked on it for, I, th I think, really almost a year. He was given a room uh, in, con in Congress, and uh, the 
people were very, the representatives were very helpful. They came in and sat for him in the mornings, and I think altogether he painted, if I'm, I think the number is correct, 68 uh, portraits in this uh, painting. It's a very, very, very ambitious. 68 members, 68 members of Congress, yes. Yes, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm very, very fond of it um, in many ways. In addition to the members of Congress, well, he has this uh, whatever guy lighting the the great lamp there, the great chandelier. Uh, others, are, the members of the Supreme Court are there. Uh, some reporters are there. Uh, his father is there, Jedediah Morris, uh, and. Uh, 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 Morse worked on it for a very, very long time and very, very hard. It was very tricky in other ways, too. The lighting is tricky. Uh, the architect is very tricky. He he worked, um, again, did sketch after sketch trying to get this vaulted ceiling uh, correct. And um, this is uh, this is what he wanted to be uh, as an artist. It's, it's a very, very nationalistic painting, I think. I mean, it's a commemoration of America. I don't know. I don't think so. The, the painting, while he was working on it, had a lot of publicity in Washington, though. I mean, it got into the press, and uh, uh, people followed it. They wanted to know, you know, who he was painting next and how far along he was. Uh, uh, it got him a lot of notice. I think that they did. I believe that's true. I, uh, I think so. Um, Morris, uh, he did most of the work in Washington and then took this large canvas. I think it's something like 80 square feet. 80, 80 square feet took it back to New Haven where his father was living to to complete it. Didn't make a dime, lost him money. Uh, it was taken to New England and put on display. It was taken to New York and put in on display. Lost money, not only didn't make money, lost money. Various explanations. I mean, it had, when it was in New York, uh, he thought it had comp competition, you know, from whatever, the circus, from other exhibitions and so on. Uh, that's what I meant. It's one of the things I meant in calling Morse's life accursed. I mean, here was his greatest effort to date. I mean, this was the early 1820s, I think, and he, he, I think he felt he felt the painting had ruined him. He had, he had invested all his talent in it. He had uh, given it his, you know, his best abilities, and it went absolutely nowhere. Well, of course, you know, as given Morse's Congregationalist background. You know, in, in, in the 1660s in uh, Puritan Boston, when the Pope has appendicitis, it's front page, page news in the press. I mean, it's partly just the old, you know, Calvinist, pro Congregationalist antipathy to Catholicism. But uh, Morse also spent time in Italy. I mean, he uh, Italy was a great training ground for painters. Uh, he had been preceded there by people like Benjamin West, uh, uh, it, you know, there was nothing to see in America. There were no great paintings really around for an artist to, to look at. You wanted to see great art. You went to, to Italy or to France. Uh, Morse went there, uh, I think really, I think he spent two years, and um, loved, loved the art. I mean, he saw everything, was just overwhelmed by what he saw. At the same time, uh, thought that uh, the, the, the omnipresence of Catholicism had destroyed the country. I mean, uh, people, the streets were full of beggars. Uh, everything was dirty. He blamed it all on the, the church. Not only that, but he, um, well, there was one episode when Morse was, it was a celebration of the host that Morse attended, and he was standing on the street when uh, a kind of canopy came down the street with the host underneath it. And everybody uh, watching took off their hats and bowed or made a sign of the cross or something. And Morris was taking notes and kept his hat on. And when the host passed, a soldier came up to him and uh, started cursing him out and then knocked his hat off with the butt of his rifle. That's, that's an episode Morris never forgot, and he keeps repeating it in one political tract after another. That as he, as he saw it, Catholicism was a religion of force. This is as opposed to... Let's say Protestantism, where you heard sermons, you know, your your reason was appealed to, all that made uh, kept people in line in Catholicism was guns, and he brought this back to uh, America and camp became a leader of uh, American nativism, and uh, wrote and spoke constantly and very loudly against uh, Catholic immigration to America. 
Well, of course, I mean, nativism, you know, in America in the 1830s and 40s, is pretty widespread. I mean, the uh, nativist candidates did pretty well in uh, local and state elections in uh, the 1830s and 40s. There was a lot of fear of uh, immigration. Uh, you know, you know, I, we can understand it, I think, our, ourselves now from the point of view of 9-11 or, you know, the French are having some, some worries like this, too. Uh, Morse's thought and was that uh, the church really intended to topple American government and really to take it over. Uh, people, you know, in the 1830s were still not far from the War of 1812. The British had come into Boston, you know, uh, come into Washington, burned the capital. The French and the Spanish government still had various designs in the early 19th century on America and Mexico and so on. Uh, the, the idea that things were brewing in Europe to to take over the government, to come back to restore uh, monarchism or something like that in America, it's, it's very close to their thinking. No, uh, that was, in a way, that's the most difficult part of Morris's life. The itinerant portrait painting kept him on the road, and uh, his, apart from his family, apart from his children. Uh, for when he went to paint in Charleston, she did, South Carolina, she did stay with him for a while. But otherwise, she and the children were there in uh, either in uh, New Haven or uh, somewhere in New England, and he was on the road. He had had a very good year in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, the year before. He went back in 1837, 38, and uh, actually. He did fairly well. The other painters in Charleston, he found, were starving. But the, the Depression had hit Charleston, too, and it, yes, it lowered his... Even though he hated doing portraits, he was doing them and making some money, but now it was hard to even get commissions for portraits. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good one. That's a tough one, actually. Uh, as a student at Yale, he had, he had liked science, and uh, Yale had one of the best science departments, probably the best science department in the country. And uh, he had attended some, at college, he had attended some demonstrations on electricity that fascinated him. Uh, in one demonstration, as I recall, the students held hands, and uh, 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 the first student was given an electric shock, and it went through all of them holding hands. And uh, he spent a summer working in what is called the Natural History uh, Cabinet at Yale, doing some, some kind of experimentation. He had also done some invention with his brother. They invented a, a, a flexible pump, excuse me, a flexible piston for pumps that could be used for fire engines or garden hoses. The, the, the idea of invention and an interest in science and electricity was there pretty early. Uh, what uh, brought it to the stage of wanting to invent the telegraph, it's a complicated story. Apparently, he was coming back from France in, what, 18, is this 1830 or, you know, and uh, there was some talk about sending an electrical current um, among the passengers and whether uh, a current could be sent instantaneously across a long wire. According to Morse, that gave him the idea that uh, if if that was true, if a current could be sent instantaneously to a wire, um, it might be possible to send messages by electricity. And according to him, as soon as he got home, he started working on the problem in his artist, artist studio at New York University and put together his first telegram. Very, very controversial. Well, another guy, uh, passenger on the Sully uh, Char named Charles Jackson, Dr. Charles Jackson, who was a geologist uh, and physician with interest in science and also interest, some interest in the arts, he later claimed that it was he who gave, on the Sully trip, who gave Morse the idea for the telegraph and who said, well, if you can send a, like, electricity instantaneously through a wire, it should be possible to send messages. And in fact, as soon as Morse brought out his first telegraphs, um, Charles Jackson uh, threatened him in all kinds of ways with exposure, challenged him as the inventor of the telegraph and so on. Uh, Charles Jackson is not someone you'd like to believe, though. Uh, for one thing, he later also claimed to have discovered anesthetic. Uh, Leonard Gale was a professor of physics at uh, New York University. When Morse did his first telegraphs, um, they were not 
uh, strong. I mean, one of the problems was he could send a, uh, an impulse through, say, 40 feet of wire. However, if this thing was going to succeed, it obviously needed to be sent through much longer distances. Leonard Gale uh, had, was himself interested in magnetism, and he understood, first of all, that instead of winding the wire around the horseshoe magnet a few times loosely, as Morse had done, what was needed was to wrap it tightly a lot of times, that that would increase the, the transmission power. He also understood that Morse was using a, a battery that is, I guess it was nitric acid and a couple of metal plates, um, that he needed a much more powerful battery. And Gale then put together for Morse, I think it was a battery, as I recall, with several more cups to it, uh, cups of nitric acid. That was a huge boost for Morse's telegraph, and instead of sending it 40 feet, he was sending messages then, whatever, 1,500, 2,000 feet, something like that. So Gale helped him very much. Um, hmm. Oh, boom, boom, at that time, e yes, but very, very different kinds of telegraphs. Uh, not, not what you think of as the telegraph, very complicated devices sending uh, impulses short distances, impractical, really nothing that could be used. When Morse uh, started off uh, f in his earliest telegraph, he used a, an alphabetical code, a numerical code. That is the, it's, it's strange looking, but his machine, his first telegraph, produced a set of V's on a tape. And uh, there would be, say, three V's followed by two V's. And that would, then the number would be 32. And you would have to then look in a dictionary for number 32, and that would be the word being sent. Uh, say it was spoon. Uh, then on the tape, you would say there would be six V's followed by two V's followed by five V's. That would be word 625. And uh, you looked up in this huge dictionary that Morse prepared, this huge uh, size of a refrigerator, and that 625, and that would be windmill or whatever it was. He gradually refined all of that and, and then started developing his famous dot dash code, uh, sending not V's, but dots and dashes representing not numbers, but letters of the alphabet. There's been a lot of controversy about that because one of Morse's associates, Alfred Vail. Um, Vail himself didn't claim that he had invented the quote Morse code, but later descendants of Vail and um, associates of Vail claim that it really was his invention. I don't think so. I mean, it seems to me pretty clear that Morse himself invented the, the Morse code. Vail was a student at, at New York University. He had just graduated, and um, he had seen some of Morse's demonstrations of his telegraph at New York University and was very interested in it. And Morse was drawn to him because Vail was an experienced, um, we call it, I mean, Vail's family had a mach uh, machine shop in Morristown, New Jersey, and Vail was an experienced machinist. Morse knew nothing about anything like that, but uh, he could see that somebody who might be able to tool parts of the telegraph uh, would be very helpful for him. No, Vail, uh, uh, if we're talking about the same veil, there were there were, lot, there were different veils. Veil died fairly young. He died in his, uh, gee, I think in his late forties or so. His wife Amanda, sort of pursued Morse, until his dying day, d demanding that he give more um, credit to uh, Alfred, as as part of the in inventor of the telegraph. It was very very startling to people I, at the time. I mean, people did. People did not understand electricity, did not understand electromagnetism. If you read a newspaper accounts, it, they dazzled to think that uh, this, that electricity, the most powerful, which they thought of as lightning. Uh, they had no concept, really, of batteries. And so and somehow Morse was taking lightning, and he was the most powerful force in nature, and he was sending it through a wire. And it was staggering uh, to people. Once the telegraph really got going, and that, that took a long time, uh, it transformed, you know, business life, social life. It had a, an enormous, uh, enormous effect. I mean, in, in journalism, the, you know, the idea that you could get news from the front in the Mexican War or something and send it up to, to Washington, uh, various newspapers started sending out bureaus in different places. You got the, really, it's the beginning of the Associated Press. 
uh, in, in business life, um, you could do all kinds of business transactions by the telegraph. You could if sent out an order. You could find out where the order was. Socially, you know, if you were, if, if Dad was in Boston and he wasn't feeling well, and you were in New York, you could get a message from him saying, "Oh, I'm I'm feeling okay," and that was a great relief. Uh, it, it transformed every part of uh, really existence in America, and it worked synergistically. I mean that the railroad was also developing, and um, big corporations were coming into being, and the the telegraph fit in with with that, you know, and uh, was energized by those things, and those things were energized by the telegraph. Yes, well, that was a part of Morse's uh, being accursed was having ever gotten involved with F. O. J. Smith who was a congressman from Maine. Uh, Smith was so impressed by the telegraph that he gave up his seat in Congress to work with Morse. And um, characteristically, he wanted some uh, piece of the action before he left Congress. Morse, who was, you know, extremely, what shall I say, uh, you know, a very honest guy with a lot of integrity, which would, wouldn't hear of anything like that. The idea of cheating the government in some way would, would be appalling to him. Um, in any case, though, he saw that Smith was very well connected in Washington. Smith knew the business world, too, as he, he more certainly did not. So he and uh, Smith and a few other people formed a partnership to advance uh, the telegraph. For Morris, it was a gigantic mistake because uh, uh, Smith could do almost nothing honestly, and he got Morris involved in all kinds of uh, very shady kind of schemes. And then he, he persecuted Morse endlessly until the, uh, until the end of his, his life. He was, he was a mean, everybody said of him, he was a mean guy. I, my recollection is Morse went to them, I think, for $30,000 to, um, to do the line. I think they gave him forty. actually. I think they gave him an, another 10000 for other expenses he might have. That was the first public um, demonstration and building installation of a telegraph in America, the Baltimore to Washington line. Smith was involved in that. He he did some of the contracting for it, and as I recall, he, one of the contracts went out to his his brother-in-law, I think this is correct, not a good idea. Uh, and uh, the, there later came a lot of legal complications out of that. Well, this was the Magnetic Telegraph Company. I think Morse, my recollection is, I could be wrong, I think Morse owned just about half. And I think, I think the other partners owned the other half. Amos Kendall had been the uh, secretary of um, whatever it was, the post office, the uh, postmaster general under Andrew Jackson. Um, he had a very uh, large reputation in the Jackson administration. He wrote speeches for Jackson. Jackson trusted him, and he was he was very very close with Jackson, especially in Jackson's war in the you know the Bank of the United States. Uh, Kendall also was very interested in the the telegraph, and he offered to be Morse's business manager. I mean, he, he understood very well that Morse had no business sense at all and needed somebody to manage the business end of it and offered uh, to do that. It was the, That was the best luck that Morse ever had because Kendall, like himself, uh, like Morse, Kendall was somebody of real, you know, integrity and uh, some feeling and he was, a like Morse, a very religious guy. and. Uh, took over this mountain of correspondence and bill paying and, uh, you know, even getting p cedar posts for the telegraph that was involved in, in getting the telegraph started. Yes, well, there's another. That was sort of the fir one of the worst examples of his accursed life. Morse had gotten a commission to paint a full-length portrait of the Marquis de Lafayette. I mean, to a lot of Americans, Lafayette was George Washington second. I mean, they they loved this man, and he, they so embodied in him the whole meaning of 1776 and you know of American independence. Congress paid for a, a triumphal, I think, 50th anniversary visit of Lafayette to the country where he was going to tour all the states, and uh, the New York City Council commissioned a voted to commission a, a full length portrait of. Uh, Lafayette. It was a great commission. It was a very important commission. And it went to Morse. I mean, this is the biggest break he had, by far, he had had as a painter. And he, he started painting the, the Lafayette in New York. Lafayette then went to, to Washington, and he followed, Morse followed him there, and was painting in Washington. He was delighted to be doing this commission. And for Morse, too, Lafayette was 
you know, was a great hero and delighted to be meeting Lafayette. While he was painting, he got a um, letter from home saying that his wife Lucretia had died uh, in, and she had just apparently some heart ailment. But she was a young woman in her 20s. She'd gone into bed and, and was dead. Um, that seemed to more certainly the pattern of his life. He would be at some apex of his career painting Lafayette. The message would come that his wife was dead. Yes, that's the Gallery of the Louvre, uh, the, or the Grand Gallery of the Louvre. I would agree. I think it's my favorite Morris painting, too. Um, no, that's James Fenimore Cooper and his daughter. Just Morris in is in the center there, giving some instruction and in drawing, too. Well, instead of now having the heads of 68 members of Congress, we have most of the great best-known paintings in the world reproduced on the, on the walls of the Louvre. He, he imagines them all being on the wall of, walls of the Louvre this way. And uh, they're wonderful miniature uh, reproductions of some of the best-known paintings, the Mona Lisa and others. Not only that, but they're done in perspective so that, you know, it's, a, again, a very ambitious and very, very complex uh, painting. Uh, Morse worked on it also for about a year in Paris when he was studying. Uh, he did it in the, in the Louvre. and. Um, attracting a lot of attention. People would stop by and see what he was painting. Then there was also, I think it was an outbreak of cholera, was it cholera? It was some, an outbreak of some serious uh, illness. I think it was cholera passed through France and people started, they started carting corpses out of Paris and people started leaving the city. More stayed in the Louvre painting this uh, really huge canvas. Uh, same story. Uh, he took it home and it went nowhere. Nobody came to see it at uh, exhibition. He finally sold it to some collector for relatively little money. Uh, it's an interesting question, you know, because his portraits turn up here and there. Uh, people buy, they buy them uh, at very reasonable prices. Uh, I just happened to be speaking with the poet um, John Ashbery, a while ago, and he mentioned to me he had been in some gallery in, I think, in upstate New York, and there was this painting. He liked it very much, and the owner told him it was by Morse, uh, so he bought it. Uh, but there's no, there's no vigorous market for Morse's paintings. Uh, no, that was it. He he even said he wished he he wanted to just destroy all his paintings. It, not only that, um, the Telegraph had taken over his interest, but he was just terribly disappointed by his career. It's a very sad part of Morse's life. They were really left on their own. They were farmed out to relatives. They were given to his brothers or to just other families who were willing to look after them. Uh, they complained to him, too. Susan seems to have been a lovely sort of young girl. She would write to their very, very touching letters. You know, she would put in a little heart and something and say, when this you see, you remember me. Father, please come home. Heaven, please visit me. Haven't seen you in such a long time. Very, very touching letters. But he, um, he went on. He, he not, not, not a good dad. I mean, and even worse with his sons. He felt he had utterly lost contact with his sons. Some brain, you know, some organic brain problem. I, I think, well, partly, uh, it's you know he told himself and says some places that. You know, he's doing it for them. He's on the road, he's uh, painting portraits, he's earning money. It's it's for them, and so he can support them. He needs to, to be away from them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, though, you know, he had this uh, very strong sort of Calvinist belief, or at least he used this, this sort of explanation that you should not hold your children up as idols. You can't really get too attached to the things of this world. Uh, if you make your wife or your children Idols. I mean, your real love belongs to God, and that's where all your emotion, all your affection, must really be invested. This is the kind of you know explanation he gave himself. I uh, seems pretty transparently, you know, some attempt to justify. Um, uh, I don't know. Very typical. Oh yes, um, there's an uh, uh, more so liked to write, you know, he, he wrote a tremendous amount, not only thousands of letters, but he wrote and published a lot of various tracts. He, uh, he edited lots of books, he edited a volume of poetry, he wrote a lot of newspaper articles. He, you know, he was a writer too, really very much so. Uh, so there was an, an immense amount of material. I was very happy about that. No, I did that. 
Yes, yes, yes. In some cases, you know, it's gotten outrageous. I think the people I dealt with for these pictures were very good. In fact, I didn't give me a hard time. I can I can name, but will not. People who are very very tough to deal with. Uh, look at the the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, the Corcoran. You know, the gal the galleries around here are wonderful. They they have minimal charges, seventy five dollars, maybe or hundred dollars something. Uh, you can though be two three hundred dollars for a picture. It right. came out of my events. Yes, this was another of Morse's partners. Very interesting guy. Uh, tremendously exuberant, uh, brash uh, guy. He had come as a young boy from Ireland and settled in Rochester, New York. And he's a real sort of go get him, you know, 19th century, mid 19th century capitalist. He was tremendously enthusiastic about the telegraph. And uh, he, once he got to be a partner of Morse's, he had this kind of huge schemes for extending it all over the country. Morse certainly saw it extending all over the country, but O'Reilly wanted to do it all at once. I mean, he's a guy of endless energy and imagination and, you know, lots of pep and lots of vigor. So he was already getting a line up to, to Canada and to Nova Scotia and out west to St. Louis. Morse and um, uh, Amos Kendall tried to slow him down. I mean, the, the thinking that you know, just just can't work that quickly. Uh, antagonism developed, and soon uh, Henry O'Reilly became one of Morse's worst uh, competitors and antagonists. This is, I mean, the Telegraph is a very contentious business, and uh, they, at one point, uh, Henry O'Reilly was building a line down to. It's down toward New Orleans, and Morse's company was building a line down toward. I think it was New Orleans at the same time, and they were working side by side. And Morris, you know, thought they, these guys, these work gangs, were going to have guns and they were going to get at each other and start, you know, have a huge riot. Uh, it didn't happen that way. But uh, O'Reilly didn't finally have a success with the Telegraph. In fact, his his plans were too uh, brash and too big. And good question. He was he was making more. Uh, than the president of the United States. I mean, his, his yearly income was more than Lincoln's, uh, let's say, income was. And it was made, his income was something like $27,000 a year. Was a lot of money for the time. He had a lot of money. I mean, he was a millionaire at the end. Um, let's see. Yes, those, well, that's a, that's a later version of the telegraph key. I mean, this and a later version of the so-called register. Uh, it you know the telegraph went from one version to another. Here is an early. This is the first version of the telegraph, and you see that Morse has built it inside this picture frame. This is some clockwork mechanism that uh, spun out the paper that got in imprinted. Very very crude uh, apparatus, as you can see. This made the V's on the paper tape. It's just a little stub of a pencil. Uh, eventually, yeah, he licensed you know the production of Morse instruments and. The telegraph spun off all kinds of other professions, I mean, of telegraph businesses, and there were people who just, uh, as their own employment, made telegraphs. I think it was, I think during the Civil War, they finally connected up with California. Certainly one of the most important people in Morse's life. So I, Morse had very early the idea that you could span the Atlantic and that you would be able to send telegraph messages across the Atlantic. A lot of people thought he was crazy, I mean, to, to think such a thing. Cyrus Field didn't think he was crazy. Cyrus Field was a, a very successful entrepreneur in New York. Uh, he'd made a lot of money in the paper business. And uh, he joined with Morse to build the first transatlantic telegraph. It was enormous, I mean, for people again at the time. That, that was really the moon voyage of the 19th century, the building of the transatlantic telegraph. Active, he was never really active in the business business. You know, he stayed out of the money end of it. But all of his life, he was tinkering and trying to make improvements on the apparatus. Morse had lots of uh, links to the South. I mean, as his mother's family, the Finleys, actually had come were in South Carolina. Morse had spent two years, I think, in Charleston painting. His second wife was uh, from New Orleans, and her brother still lived there. He was a sword manufacturer in New Orleans. Uh, Morris was very sympathetic to what he called the Christian slaveholding South, and uh, uh, given also his, his profound cultural nationalism, I mean, he really worshipped the United States and the idea of the United States. 
when the country started to fracture in that way, it, it, was, it was really a nightmare for him. The, the worst was happening. Well, Morris, in fact, makes, you know, as, as some other people did, very elaborate scriptural defenses of slavery. I mean, for one thing, he tries to show that slavery is justified in the, in the Bible. Uh, I, I, he, he wrote several tracts of defending slavery, and in one of them, I remember, he tries to show that slavery is a form of governance, like um, marriage or child rearing or, you know, uh, political life, and, and really no different from them. Uh, it, the religious part of it is that, you know, as, as an old sort of old line Calvinist, Morris has this firm conviction about the fall and the degeneracy of man. And uh, the only way to keep people in line is through through government. You can't, can't give people uh, freedom. In fact, one of the things that startling things that happens during the Civil War is that he turns his back on the revolutionary generation. It's just quite extraordinary because he, he really de he revered those people. But he starts writing that the Declaration of Independence uh, guaranteed a false liberty, you know, that it, it, the only real liberty is liberty under scripture, is really liberty under God's law, is liberty under governance. Oddly, Morse's father had been an early, not abolitionist, but had been for abolition early on and Morris turned his back on his father too and was aware of that and said he said he, he believed that his father if his father were living at the time of the Civil War his father would share his pro-slavery views. This is a wonderful study in the townhouse that Morris bought in New York City. I mean once he started making a lot of money uh, he bought this beautiful house in New York. It's still there and this is a picture of his study in the townhouse. They met at a party upstate somewhere. That, that's very fascinating, really. As, as you mentioned, his wife, uh, his son, Finley, had some kind of organic brain damage and was also partly deaf. Uh, he was very moved to see how, uh, some social gathering, how his second wife treated the, the boy and his deaf, deafness. And, um, oh, I, I don't know. It, it, you, you could think, really, that his marrying her was some kind of making up for his mistreatment of his son, his Did partly deaf son. Well, he's mostly living now in New York City. He had a, a farm in Poughkeepsie and used to commute to uh, really spend the summers in uh, th uh, there and then the winters in New York. But now he, he moved entirely to New York, partly because he was too, getting too old to make the trip back and forth. I think these are recorders of events in the House. I don't think they're press people. I, I could be wrong. Uh, although the Washington newspapers, at least, uh, there were reports of, certainly of doings in Congress and all. Well, I think here, and this is you know, a heavily symbolic picture, Morris is trying to uh, show the seriousness and the, the idealism of uh, America by depicting its, its institutions, its documents, its, uh, its, its, its seriousness. Yes, well, it's a Pawnee chief. There's his father there on the left, Jedediah Morse. Oh, that's a bit of a story. Morse's congregation, Jedediah's congregation in Charlestown resented all the work he was doing on geography. They thought he wasn't paying enough time to his pulpit, so they got rid of him. I mean, they they fired him. Uh, and uh, he he did not want to be present at the, the formal ceremony for his dismissal. So what he did was he got a commission from the government to visit uh, various Indian communities in uh, central in the, the Midwest. Uh, in any case, the, the Pawnee chief, uh, whom Morse paints here, is one of the um, members of the community that Jedediah dealt with in his Indian commission. Yes, he felt that uh, the, the painting Morse wanted to do above any other was one of the large um, murals for the ca the dome of the Capitol. I mean, uh, uh, John Trumbull had painted one. He wanted to do another one. Uh, he was not given the commission, though he tried for a year at least to, to get it. And he felt that John Quincy Adams was responsible for his not getting it because of some obscure hatred he had for his father. Certainly despises uh, his politics. Uh, uh, probably not. People generally didn't didn't like most personally he was hard to get along with he was autocratic he was moody uh, sort of he had a very large 
sense of himself, an extremely imaginative, very intelligent, uh, you know, very hard-working man. Thank you.